Hello all, uh, this is the NetMod uh, first interim of 2024. Um, thank you for joining. I'm gonna get started uh, on time uh, with the expectation that we're gonna see a few more people come in as we uh, go through the intro chair, uh, uh, chair slides. Uh, this is a formal ITF meeting, so our note well um, applies and everything we say here becomes part of our record. And as we know this, we are recording and we'll have the video and a transcript available after the session. Um, our code of conduct also applies. Please treat each other with respect. Um, it's a, we're a small group, but uh, we still should act uh, professionally and uh, uh, give each other uh, good turns to, to speak. Um, the, please keep your audio off. Um, we are going to use the tool for raising hands. Uh, again, since we're a smaller group, we could, we will loosen that a little bit. If we have some good back and forth discussion, you know, please feel free to, to, um, uh, have the discussion. We will moderate as necessary, uh, if that, if we're, we're finding that that's not working. Um, so, uh, please do use the Q control, particularly when someone else is speaking and, uh, we don't have a separate blue sheet. It's coming from, uh, uh, the tool we are, we do have chat available, uh, to the group and, um, often that gets used. Also, please join us for note taking. And as usual, um, only the discussion needs to be captured, not what is being presented. All session information is online. The tool also has, seems to have been reformatted a little at the top. There's a little folder. If you click on that, there are nice links to the, the two slide decks we have for this meeting. Um, the agenda is, is small, which is nice. And we have a fair amount of time available. Uh, we scheduled it for a, a good amount of time so we can have good discussion, but we're under no obligation to use the full time. So as the conversation ends earlier, we'll end earlier. We do have a second planned interim coming up. Um, it is February 6th. I think that's a, a two weeks from right now. Uh, we, there was some discussion on time and time zones. Uh, we have selected these times based on uh, making it available to the uh, we, ha we really wanted to pay attention to the authors and make sure that the authors could participate. And yes, there is a balancing act between authors and uh, others in the working group so that they can be, uh, you know, find a good time for lots of people to attend. But of course, if we don't have the um, key contributors available, we're not going to have much of a meeting. So that's a little bit for on the, the time. That is my last slide. I'm going to change over to Shufang's deck. And I'm going to try to pass you control. Let's see if I can do it. Okay. Uh, uh, Kent, it is not letting me pass for some reason, the way you yeah, said. I was kind of curious to see what would happen. I think it's because uh, I passed the control to you in the first place. Let me um, remove, uh, how do I do this? Oh, you got it. Did you do that? Uh, no. I don't know. I did not do it, but uh, thank you for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I may have done it. Let me pass control to Shifan. Shifan, you should be able to. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, yes, I can. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Lou. So I'm going to lead this uh, system defined configuration uh, discussion today and Hello, everyone. My name is Tiu Fang, by the way. And so before the presentation, I want to highlight that this presentation actually represents a lot of viewpoints from the working group instead of the authors themselves. So the intention is try to make the uh, presentation as informative as possible. So for 
uh, first of all, I think it's worth some time for me to give a recap and overview about the agreement we have already reached. So we have a draft uh, which defines how a management client and server handle young module configuration data that is divided by server itself. So we call it a system configuration. Actually, the concept of system configuration is uh, touched by an MDA work already. We published as RFC 8342. And in the system configuration draft, in order to uh, better expose the system configuration, we define a system data store, uh, which is config true and read only. And the client can reference and override system configuration, as well as configuring descendant nodes of system configuration. And this is actually achieved conceptually by aliving both system and intended uh, merged into running, oh, sorry, into intended data store uh, during which process running tax precedence over system. And of course, this is after the configuration transformation uh, defined in RFC 8342, which actually refer to the configuration template expansion and in active configuration removal. And also we have defined two ways to satisfy referential integrity constraints in running. Either the client uh, explicitly copy the reference system nodes into running or use a resolve system parameter to allow the server to copy the reference system nodes automatically into running. So two ways to satisfy the uh, a referential complete configuration in running. And so for this presentation, uh, I'm going to mainly talk about uh, two issues that uh, we have uh, already discussed before, but I don't think we have reached um, any agreement. The first one is the origin issue, which is uh, specific to the system configuration that is copied from system into running. And the second is about the validity of running alone. This is an, an issue I think is not limited to system configuration, but kind of uh, a quite fundamental uh, concept has already been touched in MDA, but maybe not that clear enough. So I think it, it would be good if uh, we, we can reach some agreement and then the outcome could be documented in the system config draft. So, so by the way, if you have any, any comments or questions, please feel free to join the queue or interrupt me during the presentation. And so for the first issue, uh, the origin issue for system nodes copied in Kent, you are in the queue. Uh, yes, hi. Um, <laughs> I, I was just the previous slide and, and uh, or the one before that. You, it, it, it's obvious to everyone, but you were we we're talking about system configuration and, and the system data store being for uh, read only config true. Uh, I, I mean, I imagine it's obvious for everyone, but of course, the Yang modules that would be implemented inside the system data store uh, may have some config false nodes as well. And uh, of course, those config false vote nodes would not be visible in the system data store. They'd be visible in operational data store. Um, but just wanted to, in case there was any, you know, if it wasn't obvious that, of course, the system may have some config false nodes in addition to config true nodes. Yes, exactly. So the system configuration is config true, but is provided or predefined by the server. So that system configuration is config true, right? And for the, the, the first issue, the origin issue for system nodes copied into running. And this issue is actually independent of the uh, discussion of our second issue, which is the validity of running alone. Because anyway, we would allow, we would always allow a client to copy any system node into running. 
this is something we should always be, we should always allow. So we have uh, some nodes in system data store, uh, which uh, never uh, been, which is never overridden by the client in running, would be present in operational with the uh, if it's actively in use, would be uh, the would be report the origin value would be reported as system. I think this is consistent with what has MDI has defined for this origin value system. And we also have a lot of configuration in running data store and it's, it's the configuration controlled configured by the client and it's, it's not system configuration which is represented by the, 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 the yellow node in the running data store is if it's the, the server could apply it successfully, it would be present in operational and then with the origin value reported as intended. I, th I think this is also no doubt, but the, the green area might be for the, uh, the node that is created by the server and that's present in system, but then copied by the client into running. So, the question is, what would be the origin value for these system nodes that is created in, sorry, for the configuration copied from system into running? Should it be reported as system or intended? And maybe it uh, seems that, maybe it seems that uh, we, since it's, it's, it's present in running and running takes precedence over in system, so maybe the intended should seems like a, a solution, but I think the question behind this issue is that whether we always want a copy system node in running to always override and take precedence over system. One of the exception I could um, think of is that what if the copy system nodes are immutable? For example, if it's a interface type an immutable system configuration. I think this way the client is allowed to copy it into running, but this is a case where a configuration in running should not take precedence. And I, 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 I'm not convinced that intended would be informative uh, as the origin value being reported in this way. Okay, Rob. Uh, hopefully his motor working. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes, 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 yes. Sorry. Um, so my my take on this is that effectively, so originally when we, def we defined the origin behavior, we were thinking of system coming into the operational data store from a different place. And hence we're differentiating between the configuration coming in from intended slash running and the configuration coming from other sources. And the idea there was that the, in my mind, the intended was the configuration that's coming from the operator. So this is what they want the, the want the device to be doing. This is saying this is how you intend it to be behaving. And so, from my perspective, if if um, somebody either using an RPC or do, does it by hand copies some configuration from system to intended, that is what they they that's how they're intending the system to behave. So they're effectively saying uh, yes, these are the values I want you to be using. And in essence, although it's not guaranteed to overwrite other configuration nodes that are there. So my impression uh, instinct here is that if you copy system nodes into intended, then the um, origin for them should be intended. And you'd only report them as um, origin system if they hadn't been copied into uh, running. Does that make sense? Have I given a clear answer? Yes. So what would be like for something like uh... So it, even if some immutable system configuration still should be intended, right? It's yeah, that's my, so even in this case, you take the interface type, so you copy the interface type into intended, you're actually making slightly a slightly stronger guarantee. You're not just saying, uh, and, I'm, and I'm copying this, this system, uh, system configuration into running, you're saying for my configuration to be valid, I want it to have both this interface name and I want to have this interface type, as in I want to be knowing that I'm running on, a, on an Ethernet interface rather than just picking up whatever's there in the system. And hence, you are going one step further um, and saying, this is my intended configuration for this, this interface. I want it to be both this name and have this type, so it's a slightly stronger guarantee. 
Okay, thank you. So Jason, you are in the queue. Yeah, um, I, I guess I, I, I just want to support uh, or kind of agree with Rob there. Um, part, I guess a couple, a couple of reasonings for me. One is, you know, just a reminder that um, things don't have an origin up in the running and or intended data store. Origin only applies to operational. And mm -hmm. the system config we're talking about that gets copied or explicitly written flows down through intended. So, uh, you know, along with Rob's other arguments, I, I also see it as making sense for it just to be called intended. The other thing is, um, you know, we have the, that auto copy uh, function. Like I, I see that as just a one-time convenience copy. Uh, it, you know, it's copied in and it's done. And at that point, it doesn't. It's not really relevant whether it was automatically copied in or manually copied uh, by the operator. Um, I see those as equivalent. It's 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 now in the running, and uh, it's just it's just normal data like anything else that flows down through intended. Um, you know, when I, I think we clarified this. But when something is copied in automatic or manual, or, sorry, automatically, it's never automatically removed in any cases, right? Um, right. Like yes. it's not it's not managed data that's managed by the system anymore. It's stuff that was just one time copied in. So that's my view on it. Uh, yes, we, 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 yes, we do have the statement in the draft. And I, I, I think I also agree that once the configuration is present in running, then there is no difference from whether it's copied by the server automatically or explicitly configured by the client. So I would agree with you about this point. Kent, what do you think? Uh, I also agree with Rob. Um, I think that if it, it reminds me somewhat of uh, defaults and uh, and like the with the defaults draft, how you know there's the notion of like did you get the default? Is it the default value or did you explicitly set the default value? And if you explicitly set the default value, then it has more meaning. And it it, it seems very akin to that where, where instead of defaults, we're talking about them being system values. So if you explicitly set the uh, system value, which is immutable possibly. Um, but still, you explicitly set it. Uh, it cannot be overridden, unlike uh, defaults, but uh, still you explicitly set it, and so that, that maybe it has more meaning. Um, I do also think that uh, this dovetails somewhat with the second topic of, the, of your presentation, which is the, um, you know, do does running alone have to be valid? And, mm -hmm. and, and ultimately, that, that discussion is about uh, the numerous number of... Uh, you know, nodes that might appear in system that are needing to be copied into running solely so a leaf ref can become valid. There's no other reason for them to be copied into running. Um, and, uh, and, and, and if they weren't needing to be copied into running, if it was sufficient for them to be resolved externally, um, then in that case, the running plus, you know, or merged into system equals intended, uh, in that case, I, I think it might make sense for those config true nodes to appear as origin system um, because they weren't explicitly copied into running. Okay. Yen. Uh, it's been said up by uh, Rob, Jason, and Kent already, so I just want to, for the record, note my agreement. Okay. So then should the authors um, specify in the draft clearly that in this case, the origin value should be reported as intended, right? So the author do that in the next version. Jason? Um, I guess uh, I just want to clarify one, one part of the, the, the last few uh, speakers. Um, I know when I was talking about support of Rob's statement, I was thinking more of anything that got copied into running. Um, it Kent brings up an interesting question, though, that I'm not. I'm not sure if I'm not sure if uh, if if everyone uh, was in sync with, and, I, and I'm not sure myself. But I guess what I think what Kent was saying was, 
if there's uh, stuff that's in system that is not copied into running mm -hmm. um, and it appears in operational, it, it, in the current draft that flows in th via intended, even though it wasn't copied into running, right? Like the system, the system merges into intended. And I think Kent yes. was saying that those objects would be um, marked as system. So even though they, even though they flow down through intended, um, uh, you know, I, I guess there's a question as whether those would have a different, um, a, a different origin. Yeah, it, I guess it's the uh, red versus the green uh, that you're showing here. Yes. So yes, it's not current. all intended. Yeah. Right. The server now needs to remember a particular node from intended. It's actually a system configuration or a configuration configured in running. Yes. I, and this, I, I also agree that this some, seems like a little inconsistent with what MDA has defined that the origin intend, the intended origin value is actually uh, from the data that is flowed into intended. So also some kind of in, in, in con consistency from my point of view. Rob? Um, yeah, so I, I do get you were saying it's consistent. I think effectively what it means is probably this document needs to um, formally update RFC 8342 to say that it's changing this behavior. But it, in one sense, it's inconsistent because it's flowing through intended. But the other, another sense is consistent with how um, the NMDA um, architecture was uh, specifying how system config flowed in anyway. So if you took two devices before and after or with or without this data store, then their origin would be the same. So nothing actually changes there. They'd be marked as system before because they'd been system injected directly into operational. And now it's system configuration injected in via into intended. So the only thing that's changing from that perspective is like validation of is, uh, is intended valid, but it doesn't change what flows into operational. So I think even if, we, if we draw the picture slightly differently, I still think it's fine, uh, and I still think you just clarify that uh, that the, the stuff that comes from system um, is marked to system. Stuff that comes from intended is intended. Okay, thank you. And, and I can't remember on NMDA what it says about default values. Are they mark? I think they have an origin. Is an origin default? Yes, origin default. So yeah. that again is very similar in a way that. It's the same sort of argument that that you still have those default values in intended when you do the validation. So I still again think that would make it consistent. We just need to update the NMDA draft to make that very clear. Okay, that makes sense to me, Kent. Uh, yeah, first I want to thank Jason for uh, surfacing that. Um, he picked up on what might have been a subtle comment and, and brought it forward. Thank you. Um, just looking at the slide, uh, the, the three question marks in the lower right corner. Uh, I think that we're now, just to make it very clear, we're saying that that should be intended. Mm, yes, the green, I agree. The green nodes are intended. Yes, I agree. And and the conversation we were just having was about the red nodes, and uh, we're in agreement, I believe, that they should contain, it, or they should be marked as system. Yes, and okay. I also want to uh, res respond to Jason that I think the system origin value should be the right value to be reported because it's system configuration is not other data source, not other source. So I still would like to use system as the, the, the value instead of others. Yeah, for the red, I'm that, that yeah, seems red, okay red to one. me. Yep. Mm -hmm. I, I like Rob's explanation that even before this work, we did have different nodes flowing through intended with different origins, default versus intended. I'd forgotten about that. So yeah, okay. it's, because it's consistent that, that not every single thing that flows through intended had the same origin even before. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, thank you. And there is another point about this issue is about the server's upgrade migration. I mean, um, if the device is upgraded and the system configuration could possibly um, update and 
in this case, if uh, an outdated copy is still in running, I'm not sure whether we want to this uh, migration to happen on nodes in running as well. I mean, it's already the case that if the, the, the system configuration upgrades and it will, the system data store will update dynamically, but whether we want this upgrade migration to also happen on the nodes in running, I mean, or do, do you think this should be connected with the nodes with certain origin value? Because if it's in running, then the, I think the, the consensus is that we want the val value to be reported as intended. And then in this case, should the migration also happen on running? Kent. Thank you. Uh, I, this is now um, uh, the, the issue. If we don't migrate the data that, that got copied in the running, then it seems like running might become invalid. Like during the software upgrade process, the uh, underlying structure of system changes. We mm -hmm. don't migrate running, but now running, it, it doesn't match. And, and therefore it's, it moves, simply upgrading the software moves running from a being in a valid state to an invalid state, which seems wrong. Uh, I mean, I can't imagine anyone wanting that. So, um, but, okay. <laughs> so, so that if what if the uh, suppose there is a copy system node in running, and then the the value has been updated after a device upgrade, then would the leaf reference would, would this in fact the client leaf reference would that be invalid? Invalid? Could could that be possible? If it were. Yeah. If like, if it was just a leaf like, reference, like the yeah. the it, like, and I know the second topic is whether or not we have to copy things over that are just leaf refs, but if it mm -hmm. were uh, just leaf ref and and system migrated, I don't. There's nothing to migrate in running. Running would still have the leaf ref. The leaf ref would still be a valid leaf ref. Um, I'm more concerned about the like, for instance, if you want to configure a descendant node underneath a system node. Um, mm -hmm. But somehow that system no change. I mean, I guess we're talking. We're in the world of NBC type changes where where that might uh, occur. But um, and maybe okay. that's that's a good question. Maybe that's the that's the question, right? What are we talking about uh, that would cause running to become invalid? It, would it be an an NBC change? And um, and maybe when it's not a NBC change, then everything works fine. But when and and no special handling needed. But when it is an NBC change, we say um, it's possible that running could become invalid after a software upgrade. I'm going to step out of queue to see if Rob has anything to add to this. So I, I think there's different choices here. And I, I actually wonder whether the answer here may be to sort of rule this as out of scope and just leave it as, as server defined behavior. So I think one choice is, as you say, is to update running uh, to keep it valid but i'm not sure in some things like the modern systems how much that helps because it would still leave the um the controller with the wrong configuration because the the server's modified running configuration so i like the architecture where uh, effectively what gets written into running is directly in the under control of the controller and hence um you don't change it you, the, like the device doesn't change it without the controller's author, uh, authorization um or agreement to change that configuration. I think uh, other ways to approach this problem is, as you say, is to not update running, but flag is being invalid and then have a requirement that the controller comes in and, up and corrects the configuration before it does anything else. You could also reject the, the upgrade or the install operation and say, no, you have to change this configuration first before allowing that to go through. So I think it's sort of different choices as to how you could do this. Um, I don't know whether we want to solve this here or just say, actually, uh, this is left out of scope, pragmatically. OK. Personally, I would like to leave this as out of scope, but I would also like to hear what others think about this. Blash? I think there are some changes to the system config that 
yeah, you just can't handle really. So if if you make a mandatory new new leaves or new attribute, uh, then and they are not there, you just can't handle it. In this case, I think upgrade has to fail. There's a big category that you can handle in an automatic way. It would be interesting to separate these two categories, but I think at least we have to state that if the system config changes, then that runs the risk of either failing or invalidating the running config. So the risk must be stated. Whether we solve it, yeah, that's a question. Okay, thank you. Jason? Yeah, I, I agree with out of scope. Um, I, I, well, I think it'd be very difficult to define one behavior um, mm -hmm. that everyone's going to agree on. Uh, it may be worthwhile, uh, you know, saying it's out of scope, but I, I sometimes find it useful to have illustration of examples of behaviors that could be possible. So uh, it, I, I find sometimes that helps actually like just staying silent on something's out of scope is one thing, but sometimes it's helpful to explicitly say that this problem is out of scope in the draft and maybe even give a few examples of different behaviors that could be possible. It'll help people understand in more detail what is out of scope. So it, it, just just a thought, we, we, we may want to explicitly say it and, and even give a few examples of different behaviors that could occur. Okay. Okay. So Kent. Uh, okay, I think I'm. <clears throat> I, I want. I I kind of want this to be in scope, but I respect that. Um, maybe as Jason says, some examples would be enough. Uh, Rob, you know, surprised me when he mentioned uh, the concerns of the controller and and that if it might if the if a server migrated the data, the the controller would be surprised. Um, I mean, I would hope something like e tags might, you know, cover that scenario. But, but that notwithstanding, I was I was not even thinking about the controller at all. It wasn't even in the picture. I was more just thinking about if the server gets up software upgraded, and something about that software upgrade causes running to become invalid, and and now the server I don't, I won't say it can't boot, but it's not operational. It it I mean. Usually when people do upgrades, it's sort of an inline upgrade. Uh, temporarily, the service is down, you know, traffic is not flowing through the device, but um, it, you know, potentially a, serv a software upgrade and now this, this, the server uh, is down, traffic is not flowing um, until the operator manually d does something. Uh, I, I, I would, I, I think, you know, going to Jason's comments about examples and pos possible remediations, um, Rob's uh, suggestion or third point about pos the server possibly refusing to do the upgrade because of it it knowing this, and then maybe a force flag like a dash f. Many commands have this notion of a, you know, are you sure you want to do this? And and maybe it's okay because it's in a clustered environment and they're doing um, you know they can take down one cluster member and upgrade it and then bring up another and so it, it, it can be done safely. But but it, it seems like some guidance might be uh, desirable, so thank you. Okay, okay, so we may do this as future work, but now I agree it would be good to open the door in the system config draft and leave this as future work, okay? Rob? I, I Yeah, I think that sounds like the right answer here. I mean, um, going back to Kent's point, Again, the thought is if if you've got some scenarios where the controller is defining the whole config for the device, and there's cases where, like the zero and um, uh, DTP scenarios, where the device just boots up and pulls down the configuration, it's always the, the the device should always be using the configuration the controller is giving it. So for it to be running a different configuration isn't necessarily a helpful state. Um, further to that point is that when you say like if you can't change the keys, there's different ways you might resolve that configuration. When it becomes invalid, you might say, "Okay, I know what values these leaves should take, so I'll, so I'll update the configuration to take those leaves." Uh, but you won't always necessarily know that. You might say, "I want to delete these leaves because they're invalid," and I'll apply the configuration. I'll keep delete, deleting bits of the configuration until it becomes valid. But that might mean 
you start to remove ACLs off an interface or something. So it's really risky to know whether the device ends up with a configuration that is secure and what the operators want, uh, want it to be running. So I think, I think there's so much complexity here uh, and choice that, that just saying uh, that this is out of scope, I think is the right answer. Uh, I do agree with Balaj's comment earlier where he says we should certainly highlight the risks in that scenario that this might change. I think that's a sensible thing to do. Um, as to whether having examples here, uh, it may be some in the appendix, but I just worry that maybe that will bind us in future. I, I wonder whether having a separate informational document in future about describing what might happen on uh, during an upgrade might be a better path, because um, I don't want this document to slow down a lot because of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, so I guess I suggested the examples. I, I, I see what you mean, Rob. I guess I would just want to make sure that uh, we're clear in this draft about what is out of scope. So as long as we have other, we don't have to, don't have to do it with examples. I just often find that very illustrative to, for people to figure out what you mean is out of scope. So as long as we're clear about what is out of scope, then we don't we don't have to put all the examples. The other thing is. Um, this discussion we're having about upgrades, I know the system data may add some complexity to it, but fundamentally we're discussing something right now, which is completely independent of this draft. Like we would have this exact same debate about what to do without system, you know, without the system uh, data store discussion, you know, what do you do for upgrades? Can your running become invalid, et cetera. So uh, system may add a little bit of complexity to it, but fundamentally we have an issue around this that's that's independent of system and one statement rob you made that might be uh overlap a little bit with the other issue we're going to talk about is you know during upgrade you mentioned well maybe maybe the running becomes invalid but uh i don't know if maybe, maybe that's going to tie into the next topic but i'm not i'm not i'm not i'm not sure conceptually it's it's really going to be allowed or advisable for us to have such thing as a state where the running is is an invalid data store, but uh, maybe, maybe I guess we're going to get on to that soon. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So just going to very quickly respond back to Jason. So yes, I agree that the upgrade topic is completely sort of orthogonal to this data store, really. Um, and go back to examples. Having a couple of examples would be okay with me as long as you're not trying to write uh, a complete list and it's just a couple of examples of how systems yes. could behave so don't try and make not, it uh, yeah. complete yes. yes that'd be fine okay i would very much like a few examples examples not uh, not recommendations So maybe um, we can try to document some a couple of examples in the appendix and and then let's check whether it would be useful or not. Maybe. But document this is out of scope in the the normative text as normative test and then a couple of examples in the appendix. Would that be useful? I'm not even sure appendix because that may make them beefier, like bigger than we want. I I was more thinking, you know, eight uh, eight word summary of a couple of examples in brackets. Um, I'd be slightly worried if we make it an appendix. It's going to uh, we're going to put too much into it. Okay. Is it Balaj in queue? Sorry, no. Appendix can be short, but nothing special. Uh, just picking up on what Jason mentioned about <clears throat> this is not new or, or it's not specific to system. Already a server upgrade might update Yang modules that are, you know, in running and uh but we never discuss whether or not there's a need for migrating 
the, the, the data because uh, at least with 7950 section 11, all updates have to be backwards compatible. Um, and so it would follow that any update of a Yang module that's implemented in the system data store would also have to be backwards compatible um, per 7950. Of course, with the versioning um, effort that's in the way, there's a possibility for NBC change to occur. Um, but I think maybe we need to move it to that draft to solve this problem. Um, if there's a need for a data migration to occur, whether it be in running or system, that draft should speak to um, the server behavior. So I think for this draft, it doesn't need to do much other than to um, acknowledge the fact that um, NBC change may occur um, and, uh, and, and with the system configuration data as well, and that the other draft would have to discuss how, the, how that's resolved. Okay. Okay, thank you. Sorry, I, I'm as one of the people involved, or authors of versioning, I don't think versioning wants to take on the full upgrade discussion. Yes, NBC changes will be documented according to versioning, but NBC changes happened in real life before, and versioning, I don't believe, will solve the migration and upgrade problem. Uh, I, I guess somewhat along the same lines as Balash, uh, I think I think maybe Kent's right that this uh, this problem of upgrade related to NBC changes is kind of in the scope of the larger versioning work. Uh, I mean, the versioning work as a whole is a huge topic, right? With uh, five drafts underway, et cetera. So I think it it kind of does fit in with the scope of that work but uh we are definitely not going to try to solve it as part of the first two drafts we're going to go to rfc with that would just that would just slow that work down that we're desperately trying to wrap up so i think we could consider you know treating it as part of versioning work it just uh it just i don't think we should hold up the first two drafts uh with that issue So just thinking a little bit more about this, it, it may not be that the an NBC change occurred, but that the the value change. Uh, so in system, maybe uh, the value was originally 100, and the operator you know copied 100 into running, and so now they made it explicitly 100, but during a system upgrade, now the value is a you know 101. Uh, so the the value that got copied. So it's not that the the schema changed, the data model didn't change, the the, the value changed, and uh, that 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 might be a slightly different issue. It's not an NBC issue. Yeah, that's a great point, uh, Kent. I think uh, that that is different and maybe actually worth talking about here. Um, I I don't I don't I don't off the top of my head know the right answer there, except that I think once it was copied i kind of view it as you're done like it's not data that's actively managed by the system anymore so if you upgrade and your built-in quas profile in your system data store has decided to you know use 101 instead of 100 uh, i mean my initial view would be that's nice but that's that's too bad if you already copied it into running um, but don't forget often the use case for this is someone will just leaf ref those built-in policies, et cetera. They may decide to override the parameters, but if they do, it's because they've thought about them. They explicitly want to set them or override them. Um, so if they're just referencing them, they'll pick up the updated value for, you know, for child leafs. But I think we should think about uh, more some worst cases where, let's say, you have a capability in system that says you can use one, two, or three, and then after some time you take away three. Anyone who used three will have a must statement or a leaf ref, and that really makes the configuration invalid. And it's not just that it's slightly a different value, and okay, we use it. No, it's invalid 
tree is not allowed anymore, you try to use it to invalidate. And Jason's correct about uh, if it's just a relief ref, then in the in this in value changes, it, there's no um, effect to running. Uh, I guess we're discussing the values that actually did get copied into running, and I, and again, this might the topic of the next half of this presentation. Uh, it might be well, what values need to get copied into running? So you know, and many times, so like the, and the reason why you're copying anything into running anyway is so. It, um uh so valid so can running can be valid alone and uh do do all those values need to be copied into running or just the key values need to be copied into running um perhaps there's some discretion and and it turns out that the values that get that could get changed uh are not the key values and so it's a non-issue i think maybe the draft has a proposal earlier saying that only the keys need to be copied for the system to be able to use those objects for for, for the OS to be able to use those objects. Um, I kind of align to that. Um, and back to Balaj's point, Balaj, if if option three is no longer valid, I think that's an NBC change of the data model, right? Because um, it's don't forget anything that's copied from system into running means the same Yang module applies to system and running. Um, in fact, I think that's always true. I don't, I don't think a Yang model is bound to system and a different Yang model is bound to running. Um, and there's not, uh, like it's, be, because stuff moves back and forth between system and running, it's the same Yang modules. So that might be an NBC change you're talking about, uh, or no, I might be misinterpreting. I think it's just a data change, really. Think about the leaf, uh, leaf list that lists allowed values. And then you have either a, leaf ref towards it, or maybe a must statement towards it. And then suddenly that value that you were looking for is not there. The model didn't change, just the values of that leaf list coming from system, uh, not one, two, three, just one, two. Yeah, I'm not, I'm, so I might, I'm not sure I'm totally following it. Uh, maybe we come you back to that three point options though. stored in the leaf list. And until now, you had one, two, three as the values of that leaf list. Now you only have one, two. The model hasn't changed. In Just system? To... Yeah, in system. You took away one value from this, uh, the, this leaf list. And that if there's any reference to that leaf ref instance identifier when must statement <clears throat> to that specific data value, then you are invalid. So if a system configuration references another system configuration that which is no longer valid, should that server adjust that reference? Should that be the response of the about the client to, to do that adjustment? I think we should just list the risk and some short examples of what you can do with this, but this is the bigger upgrade problem part of that. OK. I, I was going to comment on the copying stuff into running, but I, I wonder if that's actually straying onto the next issue anyway. But um, I was just going to make the comment that if you copy keys across, one thing we need to think of very carefully is about, does that then imply you write the data models differently to do that? So Kent's uh, drafts related to uh, keys and key management all of those, there's, there was question marks must in my any review of those as to whether you mark some of the children as mandatory true or not. And um, I think semantically the data is mandatory true, but then you want to have just the keys in running, you have to force it to be mandatory false. Now, the conclusion I came to was you should make the data model so it's right, so correct, regardless of which data store it's in, but that then has this impact that you can't just copy the keys across unless you start to say, you know, mandatory true doesn't have to be enforced in this case or something like that, but that might be a Yang next rule. Okay. Balash, are you still in the queue or? No, sorry. Okay, so, so Rob, you mentioned, when you said keys, I wasn't sure if you were talking about 
keys is in the key store or some security thing, or you meant Yang list keys. Uh, so I, I was given the example of when you're referencing like a Quas profile object, um, but uh, I, th I think if, if the system data store contains nodes that are mandatory in the data model, those would also need to be copied across in order to make running valid. So I, I know I was using leafref because it's the most common and easily understandable use case for system data store. Um, but there's other constraints that need to be resolved in order for running a data store to be valid. And I think all those constraints, like if we're going to say running has to be valid, then you'd have to copy over, you know, list keys. You'd have to copy over mandatory nodes. You'd have to copy over things that I guess resolve to make must statements true. Uh, so it's, I don't think it's as, as simple as just the list keys. And and just uh, just to reply back to Jason, and that's sort of the crux of the issue that I had when I was reviewing Kent's drafts was that you then get to this dis this discussion or consideration of saying, should we mark some of these, should we sort of take the mandatory true off some of these nodes so that they don't have to be copied across because you might not want to copy the some of the private uh, key data into running, for example, uh, or, or even the other keys. So that was the sort of case where I'm worried about people changing the data model so that you can make this copying easier. And I think that that's not necessarily the right way to go. I think get, get the data no, model right. Often for these system objects, don't forget it's it's what we're talking about is instance data populated in, in the system data store. So I keep going back to like a quas profile. So you have a built-in quas profile, but there's also operator created quas profiles in the same model. And you need to express that, hey, when you create an operator, specific profile, this parameter is mandatory. So exactly. yeah, you don't want to lose that information. Yeah, and that's the tricky point, I think. Agreed. OK, so I think we uh, can. can. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that was a great discussion. And it looks like we may have run it to ground, and we can move on to the next one. Yeah, yeah, we, we kind of touched the, already touched the second point. So. Richard, do you want to comment? Yes, I just have a question. I, I got distracted and I know we were talking a lot about software upgrade and all that. For that second bullet there, what if the copied system nodes are immutable? Did we agree on that? I mean, my take is running should always be valid. Uh, yes, the node is immutable. It just the client cannot override it with a different value, but should be allowed to be copied into running. I mean, if it's like like a, a, an interface type value with uh, the same exact value as what is already defined in system data store, that is okay. And we just agreed that in this case, even if it's immutable, then the origin should still be reported as intended. Okay. The other thing, Rashad, if you're if you're off for a moment, you might have missed is we we decide to make the upgrade issues and data data migration conversion out of scope of this draft. So if yeah. if you upgrade your software and your Yang models change in an NBC way, does your server, does your router, you know, convert data, etc., that's going to be out of scope. Okay. Thank you. I think it's not just the up, this model upgrade that should be out of scope, but there should be some statement like that. If the system data changes because of upgrade, because of, I don't know, weather patterns, whatever, for whatever reasons, that might make either the validation inv or invalid or maybe impossible to execute if there are constraints yeah. same way as model upgrades the instance data upgrade in the system might be impossible or or just implementation specific yes and out of scope except for a few examples and the risk okay that would work for me 
So then we are going to uh, talk about these, the second issue, which also the key issue about the validity of running alone. And the question is, it's very easy to understand is that whether the COVID uh, system uh, in the system config context is that whether we always need a COVID system node to uh, whether we always always a reference system node to always be copied into running. And to be more general is that the question is whether we always need a referentially complete configuration in running. And here we use, uh, I use the, uh, an example of the reference could be leaf reference and could also be the mandatory true or the system defined configuration defined as mandatory true or present in the when or must constraints. And that could be also considered as reference. And if there is a reference to the system configuration in system data store, should that be copied into running to make sure running is referentially complete? So that's uh, the question. And it's, it's very direct that we have two options now. And the first option is we don't copy the references not copied into running. And the second is that references copied into running. And so this is the, the issues we are going to dis 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 discuss. And before we are getting into details, I want to uh, mention some concepts that has uh, been mentioned a lot in the online validation. Flash. Uh, I have more basic question. Can you go back to your previous slide? Uh, is it a uh, requirement to have a, a this readable run uh, intended configuration for this to work? So what happens if you don't support intended or maybe it's just hidden somewhere in your software? So you don't have intended data store, the server did not implement that, right? I guess that way maybe there is still another conceptual uh, um, data store which may not be visible to the client, but still has the conceptual intended data store. That's my understanding. Jason? Yeah, I guess. I th I th I think I agree with what you're saying, Shifang. I, I I don't think this draft we're talking about today is going to mandate that an implementation uh, supports reading the intended data store. I think that's right. maybe a bit orthogonal, but that I don't think that changes the fact that there is a conceptual intended data store. Mm -hmm. So so Balash, I don't I, I don't think this draft, you know, is fundamentally requires an implementation to support reading the intended data store. At least that's not my impression from, from working with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Please state that somewhere. Thanks. Okay. So we are going to talk about the online validation and offline validation in this slide, since they are not defined in any of the existing RFCs, but both are heavily mentioned in previous discussions and in these presentations. So for the online validation, I try to define that it's about the protocol operation, i.e. the validate RPC operation enforced at the server side to validate the contents of the specified configuration. And for the offline validation, it means the, the operation performed by the client or offline tools to validate the configuration, which is fetched from the server performed at the client side. So online validation and offline validation. And also I try to uh, give some quotations from existing RFCs. Just um, we need to keep this in mind that this is something that has already been defined in existing RFCs and many and maybe uh, any of our decisions we are going to make today need to take them into consideration. So both the RFC 7915 and RFC 8342 have explicitly said that running configuration data store must always be valid. And 
Besides that, NMDA also states that intended is subject to validation. So there is a figure, a architectural model of data stores the figure in NMDA RFC, and it, it states that intended is subject to validation. And there is also some normative text to show that intended must always be valid. So some just some quotations from the RFCs. So, Jason? Um, just on that slide where we're kind of quoting the current mm -hmm. um, RFCs, another mm -hmm. uh, another thing we should probably also keep in mind is um, just the concept of kind of running code. So there are also, I mean, part of, part of the complexity of this issue is that there are implementations out there, you know, fairly, fairly major implementations uh, that do have transformations between running and intended, like an active configuration or template expansion. And some of those implementations, uh, you know, don't, don't, uh, basically they don't, they don't require a valid running on its own. Like they, they, they validate uh, after the template expansion, for example. So it gets a, it gets it gets a little bit muddy when you also take into account current implementations that kind of some of them don't really require running on its own to be valid um and there are some implementations that do so i know some client side tools that do expect offline validation to work and they will actually validate and declare a problem against the device if the instance data doesn't uh, match up against the uh the model for running so Okay, that's a good point. Thank you. Blush. Uh, just to add complexity, and I don't know what is the correct answer. <laughs> <clears throat> there are a number of groups that are speak that speaking about uh, what is the master configuration. And they say that the master configuration is not the thing on the device, but something in the management system. Now, if we say that only intended is valid i think then we run into problem with this thank you okay so i'm going to I, i'm going to um split this um issue into two different parts actually it's a uh, from a long-term consideration and a short-term consideration. So I guess we uh, let's discuss the long-term consideration of this issue first. And for the long-term consideration, I'm not sure whether, whether we should consider moving to MDS interpretation of validity of running alone. And here, the by long-term, we mean the young next or NetConf next and RESConf next. And as a uh, okay, Blush. Uh, maybe coming back to the previous uh, comment that if the intended is not visible, not readable, mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. at least the running should be valid all the time. Because you should be re able to read at least one of the one valid configuration. Just saying that something black magic happens inside. I don't even tell you what it is and check operational. That's that's not that. I don't think that's good. Okay. So, I'm I'm going to uh, uh, the the authors of MDA has maybe has acknowledged that the MDA's interpretation from a long term perspective. The interpretation is that the validation is unintended because running alone is incomplete. So for the online validation, running is invalid implicitly if intended is valid. And for the offline validation of running, it would require the client to perform the configuration transformation to running. This would include the template expansion and inactive configuration removal defined in in, in MDA and as well as to uh, merge the running into system to become intended and then validate resulting intended data store. And this is uh, easy to achieve for system aware clients, but, but might be uh, 
need pro proprietary mechanism to fetch system configuration for system unaware clients. And I guess uh, this is the NMDS interpre interpretation about this issue. And but let's assume that I think it's uh, fair enough to say that NMDS only applies to NMDS servers, right? So a client connecting to NMDS server would know to write that intended, maybe in this case. So maybe if uh, it's for an MDS server and a client connecting to MDS server, there is no issue because it knows to write that intended all the uh, the, the tr configuration transformation and uh, merge running to system and then to write that the resulting configuration instead of write that the running alone. And another question might be whether we want this to be uh, to, to we also want this to be applied for non MDS servers, and I'm I don't know the answer, but just just threw away this question and for your consideration. Okay. In my view, there are a lot of servers out there that implement don't implement an MDA or implement only parts of an MDA. So. And yes. accommodating them would be nice. Okay. Is there any other issue? Any other comment? Jason? Um I've raised this before, but and, and so I apologize. I go back to I don't, I don't really have a clear solution. But I, I guess I'm I'm feeling like in a real quandary here because I can see how it's it it kind of uh, it kind of offends my engineering sense that somehow running isn't valid. Uh, it just feels like it's supposed to be valid that people should be able to validate instance data that they control back up on the client against the Ang models. On the other hand. Um, you know, if I if I just ignore system for a moment and we think about things like uh, templates or inactive config, which are, you know, out there in the in the router marketplace, you know, I I don't see how it's at all realistic that that we could enforce that running is valid uh, when you have template expansion, which can which can expand out and 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 actually make the data store you know the actual config valid. So I'm it just it feels like i i don't i don't know what to do here it feels like there's no solution <laughs> i feel like <laughs> we're stuck we could maybe solve it for system we have a solution for system with this copy into running that i i would i would like to support but then i worry about uh template expansion and you know I, i'm not sure we can just ignore that um and i don't see how with template expansion you can never really say running is is valid offline, and and I I don't think it's realistic that a client can reproduce all the rules, subtle rules of uh, you know different servers template expansions. It it sounds simple at first, but um, I know from being involved in implementation of Nokia's that uh, there's all sorts of subtle cases um, where we might differ slightly from other implementations on template expansion. So I uh, feel a bit stuck. Yes, I, I would agree with you that I think it's already the case in MDA that running uh, because of the configuration template not being expanded and inactive configuration not being removed. So running alone cannot be valid. That's my interpretation, but it seems that I, I I don't know. I, I, I don't know the answer, but Rob. So I, I wonder whether one, a different way of framing this is to say that it, it should always be possible that an operator can manage their system with a running that's always valid. So uh, so if, if an operator wants running to always be valid, then they don't use templates. They don't use inactive configuration they don't rely on system without explicitly copying those nodes in and then they get the property that running is always valid uh, and and intended is very close to running in that case as well 
and that sort of potentially keeps their life simpler. And you could have a config knob on the devices to enforce that and say that's the case. But I also see the ability of saying, actually, for if you want clients want that extra flexibility of doing template expansion things, there's some things that have to give to be able to do that. And one of the things you're going to lose is, is this ability to potentially to validate off the box or you have more complexity to doing that. And in those cases, I think there's a benefit of relaxing the rule and saying, actually, it's intended that's valid in those scenarios rather than running. So in, in to okay. summarize, or it should always be possible to get running to be valid. There should be a way of achieving that, but it might be some configurations you can't do. But uh, if you really want to use templates and things and rely on system configuration, then those are the corner cases where it may end up not being valid. Okay, Yan. Thank you. So we have been talking a lot about uh, online and offline validation and so, uh, and those terms are easy to understand and well defined in some way. But uh, I think the real problem that I have with this is not whether you can actually validate offline or not. It is about the client being able to predict what happens when you write something. And that is the real problem for all those offline validation things. There's lots of magic going on behind the curtains. That's why it's not possible to validate online. And we need to know what that magic is exactly. So there's basically two approaches to it. Either we say that we have to define what that magic is so that we can predict exactly what's going to happen. When I say this to you in running and including these templates and in uh, inactive configurations and so on, I know what's going to happen in intended. It sounds like a difficult path, but maybe possible. Or we say that this is not so important. Uh, I mean, NetConf and RESTConf are mostly machine machine interfaces, right? And being able to have shorthand notations for different kinds of things is not that important. If I wanted to have a template mechanism, I can very well put that on the client side as well. I don't need to depend on whatever magic you are doing on the server side. So maybe that is not so important uh, in these use cases. Okay, thank you. Blash. Would actually be good to know for a specific node or specific server, will it produce a valid uh, running or not? Yes, if I read the thousand pages of documentation, there somewhere is an answer for that. But maybe it would be nice to see that as a capability that I can just read off. Thanks. The uh, the one slight problem with that, Balash, is if we go with Rob's proposal, which is actually kind of appealing to me at the moment, um, it would depend on whether the operator is deciding to use templates or uh, inactive config, the server side versions of those features versus maybe as Jan mentioned, maybe the operator would instead use the client side version of templates and an activation activated config um i'm trying to think what point was i was going to make now um so so i definitely think that there is um oh, that's the point i was going to make was i think uh, in terms of these conversations the templating and inactive configuration is two of the ones that we should consider. The other one that is obviously very pressing is the uh, is like the key store and things and, and accessing keys. I think that's the one that uh, having an answer to would be really useful in the short term because I think the ITF models are somewhat relying on being able to reference these things. And those are ones where I don't think it's necessarily the case where you can just say, you can do this off the box or potentially ignore it if, and Kent will probably correct me if I'm wrong, where security be best practices that you keep some of these keys in TPMs on the device and hence you should never be able to really uh, copy those into the configuration in, unless they're encrypted. Just to answer that question, um, <clears throat> right, exactly. If it was uh, important to the operator to ensure those uh, secret values did not um, were, were not revealed, uh, then they should either be encrypted or hidden 
if they're neither encrypted nor hidden, but in the system data store, that's not really making them secret. Um, yet they're built in, but they're still visible in the system data store. Uh, and you know, sure, it, it no, I, I mean, it's not. It doesn't make things any better to copy them into running, but it doesn't necessarily make them worse either. Okay, so what's the, the the conclusion about this long term consideration? So, I I don't feel like. Uh, Sorry to jump I, ahead of Jason here, but I was actually hoping you'd move to the next slide. I I think it speaks to this. Okay. Jason, do you want to comment? Uh, well. Uh, Comment question. So, uh, I must admit, I wasn't. I wasn't really. I haven't been following this key store work. Um, and Rob raised it as uh, a very important other scenario we need to take into account for figuring out what we want to do here. So, I wonder if others are in the same boat. And um, I, I mean, I kind of feel like I understand the inactive config and the template expansion stuff, but um, should we maybe talk more or explain more about this key store thing and how it affects this problem? I don't know if others feel that way, but Rob, if, if you and Kent think it's really kind of structural for figuring out what we want to do here, uh, more of us may need to understand uh, a little bit more about it. I'll just speak to it briefly. I, I don't think it's fundamentally different, um, but you know, something that uh, needed uh, originally the uh, key store and trust toward drafts were trying to speak to. But uh, what, what those drafts were referring to are built-in uh, certificates and or uh, built-in keys. And so certificates are the easiest to understand. Uh, many systems ship with um, you know, a set of certificates that like their trust anchors, uh, your web browser knows which root um, certificate authorities it trusts by default. So, so there's a bit like built-in certificates. Um, so those certificates uh, would be presumably in the system data store and leaf reft uh, from, uh, or, or, or the, the bags of those certificates would be leaf reft from uh, configuration in running. Um, but that's no different than any other leaf ref that we've been talking about to date. Um, and likewise with the keys uh, keys are a little bit more involved because uh, well first off built-in keys um, it's highly recommended that any the system if, if it has any built-in keys at all that they be hidden or encrypted um, it really does not make sense for a built-in key to ever be uh, in clear text but uh, if it were then you know <laughs> like i mentioned before it's kind of a problem but it doesn't make this doesn't make it any worse um, but the thing is that with keys uh, because we spoke earlier about the mandatory trueness of that data, uh, it would be necessary to kind of copy all that data into um, running as well. But I don't think that the fundamental nature of the key store and trust store drafts doesn't change anything that we've been talking about today. They're just different kinds of configuration. Uh, and just to, so the reason I'm saying they're more important is I I can see, I can't remember who made the comments that, uh, maybe it was Jan actually saying that uh, maybe you don't need to do this inactive config, you don't need to do um, template expansion because it's a machine to machine interface. Uh, and I sort of see that I have some, uh, a lot of sympathy with that view. However, having uh, accessing the built-in keys or certificates of advice feels like something that is is fairly critical and doesn't fit into that same category. It's something else where uh, it probably really is important and you can't just say, don't do this, I think. So that was why I was saying it's, I think it's a more of a critical issue. Yeah. Well, to some extent, it is possible already today. If you model your things properly, you can do references to, you can do template expansions and things like that, even today, and keep running referentially integrity. Okay, you just have to. 
I, I'm not saying you can do everything you might ever want, and but you can do a fair amount already as it is today. And we can certainly go beyond that and expand this, but then we need to, I mean, the, the important thing for me is that clients should be able to determine exactly what the device is going to do. Um, yeah, I guess on the slide here, just reacting to Rob's point, you have one and two listed, and I guess he's saying that one is not critical to Jan's point, the machine-to-machine -machine interfaces don't have to do these things, um, but two is something that we are, it, it is front and center, and I think this just comes, this is the whole discussion about, it must uh, leaf ruft values be copied into running. Okay, maybe I think we need to move on and then we can still uh, continue our discussion. So um, another question is about, can we do this now? So that means we don't wait for the young next or next nest or rest of nest. And still there are, actually I have give three options here and uh, here I added another option as option three and instead of, uh, uh, ex explicitly said that running alone is offline, valid or not, it, it, that is required. And option three would like just state that running must always be valid and it would be depend on the interpretation of this statement. So three options we are going to discuss. Oh, Blush. I think if you go back to the first option, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. uh option one i think uh, readable intended must be a precondition to this i don't think that's acceptable that machine does something inside but i don't don't, don't even know what it did okay if, i don't but... know if we want to choose this but if we want to choose a read, readable intended is a precondition okay rob uh, I was just going to say, I also think there's an option four here, which is this document says nothing at all about whether running is valid or not. So it just relies on uh, 7950 and uh, uh, 8342 that and relies on those. So it doesn't say anything whether it has to be valid or invalid. So I know it's kicking the can down the road. And that's also saying we have to wait to Yang next to fix this. Uh, but that I think is an option. Actually, I think that okay. is option three. It, it, okay. It's gonna, it's trying to say just it's kind of it says just state um you know quote running must be valid but it's not saying that running alone must be valid it just it, it as you say it defers to uh, existing um loose interpretations okay i was interpreting just state as this document would say running must always be valid and that's the one thing i don't think it should say if that's the conclusion so I, I guess Rob means we don't even state running must always be valid, right? We say nothing about this point. Correct, because you don't need to say anything because that's always that's the default case already is that running must be valid. So unless we're going to change that that and say there's some circumstances that it's not valid or it doesn't have to be valid, then we don't need to state anything at all. Okay, thank you. Okay. So <laughs> for the option one, I I I don't know I should present this already because but mm, for the option one, if we do not require running alone is offline valid and we might treat it as a clarification or bug fix in existing RFCs, but the only concern is that this option might break lexi clients and two chains for example if a client makes an implicit reference to system configuration and there is uh, lexi clients need to do the offline validation of running so things like a break and change that would have uh, a lot of impact on the lexi clients and two chains and also if we choose option one i wonder if we have we, we, we need to first standardize the configuration transformation between running and intended. For example, the template expansion and inactive configuration defined in MDA. So, Blush. 
Uh, I come back to my previous comment. Let's say I have an old client. I at least like want to know whether the server I'm connecting to, will it produce a uh, valid running or maybe not? Which one is it? If I can at least know that, I, I don't know, clients one, five, and six will always have a valid running, then, then I can code accordingly. But if I don't even know if that's required or not, that's a problem. Okay, so if you mean if we allow running alone to be invalid, then we at least to know whether the running currently in the server now is valid or not. Beside the readable intended this, let's say, indication whether it is that it might not be valid must be there. Okay. I don't know if this applies to legacy clients and things, but I, my interpretation when we we're doing NMDA, when that discussion was that running is the is intended is always invalid, even if it doesn't exist as an external data store, and running is valid through implication because you always valid, you know, validate intended at the same time whenever you change running, and if intended doesn't validate, then you reject the change to running. So it's it's implicitly valid rather than explicitly being valid. That's what my interpretation of NMDA was. And I wonder if legacy clients are effectively the same. So that those devices that, that assume you're referencing some system configuration, um, they'll validate it with that system configuration there and say, yes, it's fine. Um, but they won't validate running without a system config. I, I think there's almost certain, like, uh, Rob, I don't, I don't think that can be the <laughs> complete answer for offline. Like, there's definitely, so offline includes a lot of people using tools like, uh, you know, Yang, Yanglint, uh, where you do a read of the running and then you Yanglint it against the Yang model. <laughs> like, that, that doesn't work, right? If we, if, if it's, if, if running is only valid uh, implicitly because intended is valid. And I'm sure there are clients. Well, I, I know there are clients that uh, that that do a get config of running and complain if it doesn't match the Ang model. So there may be clients that are okay with uh, implicit running validity through the server saying it was it was okay. But there's definitely ones that uh, clients and tools in use that uh, that would be broken with this. I think my response is back to Belage's comment, I think. That's what I was trying to reply to. Which I think was on server behavior. Okay, then for the option two is that we require running alone must be offline valid. And the question is, are the complexity necessary even for the system configuration? Only the parts that are required to make running valid need to be copied. For example, the keynote. So only the parts that require to make running valid need to be copied, not all of the parts of the system configuration. And uh, the, the second part is kind of the, the discussion we had um, just now, which about the server's migration of some system nodes into running when the device upgrade. But now I think we agree this should be out of scope. And the third point is about, uh, I think it's also touched by Jason just now, also it's about how to handle the configuration templates and inactive configuration. If we require running alone must be offline valid. And for this option, I think there is no uh, NBC issues thing. So it's the option two. And then for option three, I think maybe it could be uh, treated as a possible compromise. And even the option four uh, suggested by Rob, just it means just said that running must always be a valid configuration data tree. And at reference to RFC 8342 and 7950, and or just do not even state this at all. So. This way, we don't have to state explicitly whether the reference system node must always be copied into running or not. So it, this would leave 
it up to the interpretation, and this keeps the behavior as existing uh, specifications. Okay, Blush. For me, the difference between option two and three is far from clear. If it's oh, possible, yes. basically valid, then perhaps, yeah. Yes. Yes. Less. Yes, I agree. Is there any other comments? Yan? If you go back to option two, I'll make a comment there. Mm -hmm. So here, I mean, I think it's perfectly all right from my perspective that you only have the keys to those system things and the system will understand what to do and the client will understand too, as long as we still mean that, okay, if you have a model which says that some attribute is mandatory in whatever you are creating there, this list entry, then of course that needs to be copied as well, not only keys. But if you model things so that everything is optional below this point, I'm perfectly happy. But I still want traditional Yang rules to apply. Okay. Yeah, just to say, I, I agree if we're, if, if like, it, so if we're going with option two or even option four, <laughs> in option four where there's kind of flexibility, um, I think, you know, in scenarios where someone wants running to be offline valid, uh, then it, it doesn't, I, I know we keep saying keys for simplicity and discussion, but I think it, it, it means keys, mandatory nodes, and potentially other things to satisfy must statements, et cetera. Yes, that's right. It's just an example to use the key node. If there is any other referenced node, like, mandatory tool and when must the stat, uh, statement be present as system configuration that should also be copied yeah min if, elements is another example oh right right yes min element i think the most difficult would be that you have to analyze the x part in must and when to find out what it is referencing Uh, when Blage says that we must analyze the expaths, I, I, I'm wondering who is the we in that statement, um, because I don't necessarily think um, any you know tool needs to do this, other than if they if if, if the interpretation of a specific server that running alone must be valid, then um, if if I mean it, if the operator doesn't copy enough data into running and then they try to validate the server's going to refuse and it'll just say you haven't copied enough data and um it's up to the operator or maybe i mean i was going to say operator a human in the loop but possibly we could extend it to the controllers as well um just need to keep at, you know adding more data into the running until it becomes valid a a, a, a warning message a meaningful warning message that points to exactly what the issue is uh might be difficult i mean we have the validation constraints and they'll of course flag you know what the issue is i suppose but um i mean it, it's not is it, it 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 might be iterative they, they they first try just the keys and oh it's not enough there's a min element constraint so they add more min elements and oh it's not enough because it's mandatory true so then they you know just kind of iteratively they would f finally get there it doesn't sound elegant but i think um that's what we lead would it would lead to so one thing uh kent along the lines of what you mentioned of adding more data you know otherwise it would be invalid um i mean my, t t currently i'd say uh the way this is kind of happening, at least in a number of the major uh, router implementations I'm aware of, is that the servers are typically, um, uh, they're, they're validating intended, um, but it's actually um, clients and tools that are trying to do the offline thing that are declaring the invalidity. So 
when you say you'd have to add more and more data until the server accepts it, I, I think it's actually the way around. I think the server will always accept it. You need, the operator would end up adding more and more data until their offline tools are satisfied. So I, I, I just flip it around there. I think that's that's the way I would see it working based on the current implementations. doesn't preclude adding a mode in a server, like, I don't know, strict mode. Uh, but I can immediately see performance implications of doing a second validation. So like in our implementation, if we had to now also do a second, uh, you know, strip out some data and do a second validation, that's going to be costly from a performance point of view. So it's the second validation happened on the client on or on the server it's offline or, or online validation well i don't think we need to preclude or mandate this second validation personally uh, all i was saying is in kent's example where you add more and more data until something is satisfied i don't think it's the server that gets satisfied by adding more and more data the server would always be satisfied mm -hmm. all, like most servers today are fine they 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 actually validate their intended after template expansion etc i think it's more the operator to add more and more data until the tools or clients are satisfied okay yeah yeah so we keep referring to these two main options as the online and offline validation and i think that's somewhat unfortunate because i mean of course we are also validating offline and that's, that's nice, but that's not the important point and if it's happening twice or not that's not at all the the issue that i'm concerned about it is the perfect understanding of i tell the device to do this what it is going to do that is what i need to have answered and that unless we get that passed we don't have to care about validation offline or, on, or otherwise Rob. I'll uh, turn my mic on. Um, I was just <laughs> I was just thinking about the inactive configuration as an example. So if you take that, then I can. It makes complete sense to me to validate what the configuration look like with various bits of configuration commented out. It makes less sense to me to say, and you must also validate it with that inactive configuration uh, being active. So you need to say. That you have to, if you add in configuration here, you have to both make it valid for the stuff that's commented out and also if that configuration is not commented out, which is what effectively I think making running valid and intended valid in the case that you have inactive configuration. And the answer may be don't do an active configuration, but otherwise I don't see how that actually works. Um, I was going to respond back to Yan's point, but just quickly on Rob's, I guess, <laughs> plus one to that, I guess, now that you mentioned that, um, it's not obvious that, that, uh, it's easy to construct things that they're always valid, whether the inactive config is there or out. Uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe it, that, that could, that could get tricky. Um, and the same may apply to templates. I'm not sure. Um. Jan, I was going back to your point because I, I'm hearing you um, kind of mention that you know offline validation isn't the key. It's understanding exactly what the server, a client needs to know precisely what a server is going to do. Um, I'm not totally following that and how it's different, and I'm hearing a lot of silence each time you're saying it. So I'm worried maybe uh, that's somewhere with others in the group. Um, maybe you could give an example of of what you mean there that's different than offline validation? John, are you on mute? I'm just waiting for the queue to speak. Okay. Um, 
Yes, I mean, I think I think we are in almost um, violent agreement about about validation and offline and all of these things. It sounds to me, anyway. Uh, I just definitely think it's a problem if we remove offline validation possibilities, but I don't think it is the main problem because I mean, and I didn't want this conversation to diverge into those things about performance of validating twice and stuff. That is maybe important too, but in my mind. It's much, much more important that we solve the basic integrity and understanding. As a controller, I want to be able to control and tell the device this is what you're supposed to do. And if uh, if running is the whole truth, okay, it's kind of simple. I write this. Uh, there's some validation going on on the server, and uh, then if if that goes through, it's going to do what I ask it to do. If the server is not going to act on on the running directly, but on intended, okay, sure. Uh, then I have to sort of reverse engineer uh, what intended, what I need to tell you as a server, in order to get what I want into intended. Uh, if that is a black box, that's a problem. Is that a better explanation now? Blush, go ahead. So that's why one of the reasons why I said that if you want an invalid running, you must have a readable intended. And a side comment, which I know many people don't like, but all these difficulties about offline validation, what is valid, that's one of the reasons that many uh, groups actually have allow the system to modify running. And that's a valid community still because these are complex questions we are discussing, and they want to start wanted to sidestep that. Thanks. Uh, responding to Jan uh, first, the uh, the concern for whether or not the controller can exactly tell the um, server what to do, and I think the comment was a black box. It, we definitely, uh, I, I don't see any um, anything that's not programmatically uh, exact. Uh, the, the the black box. Uh, I mean, ideally, um, IETF standardizes inactive configuration and some kind of templating mechanism someday. But in lieu of that, if we're working with a vendor, you know, proprietary um, equivalents which do exist today, um, the vendor would have to publish uh, documents that describe how those mechanisms work. Um, and but in case they don't, or if those documents are incorrect, um, not kept up to date, maintained, something's wrong, unclear, whatever the case may be, um, then to Balaj's point, which I was originally not keen on, that um, that if running alone is not valid, then uh, sorry, intended must be readable. Uh, perhaps that becomes a more true statement. Um, I, I wanted to go back to uh, a point that Jan made about. So I think I think Jan's ar argument is effectively that we should change the data models such that uh, running can always be valid. So I think that that says that in the case of ones where you've got keys and you're and you're writing to an inbuilt key or access or reference that in big inbuilt key with a leaf ref then you have to be able to express that reference without any dependency on like mandatory children and i i i just i'm worried about effectively that we are changing what is semantically the actual underlying data model is we're modifying that um so that it fits this paradigm that running is always true so you say well, actually we're going to take this mandatory statements away so that we can represent keys that have no uh, uh no uh, public or private data because we want to be able to reference them by name without uh uh without breaking this rule but at the same time that doesn't actually make sense for a key that you can't really have a key that doesn't have private data Go ahead, Jan. I guess I'm in line then. Yeah, thanks. So, I mean, we could even invent uh, 
new or I mean new reference types. We are using leafref today, and they require things to be there in a very strict fashion. But we could invent a new one in a draft document or a separate document, RFC such and such. Uh, here is a system um, default kind of reference that will point to things in this table over here, or something. I mean, we can create additional things in Yang to express these ideas without watering down what we have already. So just to reply, that's sort of true, and you can solve that, but it still fundamentally means that you just take the contents of that running data store uh, and try and validate it without access to the system data store, whether it's on, on the box or off, off the box, then it wouldn't be able to validate. You've still got some dangling pointers there. And it's whether having those dangling references is logically acceptable or not, I think. Well, uh, there's no way around that, I think. Uh, since the system data store isn't known by all, uh, there will be dangling references for those that don't see it. But if you do know about it, you could certainly do more with that sort of special kind of system reference type. Yeah, I'm wholly opposed to the idea of, for instance, a key being copied into running without its mandatory leafs. Uh, that doesn't make sense to me at all. I, Rob, I think you're exactly right in your 80 reviews that that the, uh, the the data model should be you know accurate to what the data model should be, regardless if uh, you know uh, if the if, you know to, to support the scenario where it might be copied from system. So. Um, and and somehow it not being a complete object in running makes no sense to me. Uh, I I think um, really it, it kind of goes back to the question that uh, Shifan had was can we do this now or later? Um, absolutely, we can do it later. Absolutely, with Yang next and NetConf next, RESTConf next, we can assert that clients must be able to do the offline transformations in order to uh, offline validate running um, even though it's not validated validatable alone uh, so then the, I, I mean that's my assertion I think we absolutely can do that uh, in the next series uh, but the question is can we do anything now um, and you know we could leave it up to interpret uh, the three we had the options maybe the the three options slide would be a good one to put on the because ultimately that's what we're trying to answer in the remaining 13 minutes of this call i'd propose we kind of uh, i don't know what others think but i i propose we kind of abandon option three and instead look at one two and four where four is say you know, say nothing because I think we already maybe kind of agreed that three was going to be a bit confusing and, and maybe what we were kind of meaning by it was just, just to say nothing. I don't know what other think, others think about that. Yeah, I, option four is a better option three in my mind. Agree. But, so my preference is that we, we effectively say nothing now and we rely on what's in 7950 and 8342 and that when we come to look at Yang next, we add an issue specifically to consider this and see if, if there should be either changes to whether running is always valid or whether we should add extra uh, Yang rules or primitives in there to, to be able to model this data in a way that's like not mandatory true, but mandatory in in intended true, but it doesn't have to be mandatory true in running, for example, or or something else, or, or different sort of reference that, that Yang mentioned. So I wonder if when Yang.next, we could flag an issue for this and then not worry about it now. We just say nothing uh, and servers behave the way they do today, in a sense, uh, and they follow the rules or they don't follow the rules. Jason? Um, I I think I'm kind of leaning that way as well, and because <laughs> I'm still I'm still stuck on the fact that we don't we don't have a clear a clear direction one way or the other, and I think it falls into the suggestion that Rob made 
um, and I'm not sure if there's any text we want to say about it. Maybe, maybe not at all. But that if an if a user or an operator is working in an environment where they need running to be valid, uh, then there is a way to achieve that. But they have to make some choices to not not use templates in a way that makes running invalid. Not use expansion in a way that makes running invalid. And they would have to copy stuff into running to make it valid. I think that is actually the practical approach that is possible. But you know, I'm not sure if operators are going to run it because it puts a little bit of onus back on them to make those choices and on them to keep the running uh, valid for their tools or their environment. Yes, we, we can do that, but we just keep silent about whether that is always necessary, right? You, you, the client and operator can do that, but we do not state whether that must be done or should always be done. Shafan, I'm curious, are, do you have any more slides in your deck? Just want to make sure we get everything. Okay, let me check. Okay, the the this, I think this is the, the last slide, but maybe I I mean if if we can reach any agreement if and having it explicitly that it would be good, but in it seems not seems that we are not ready uh, now for this to be done. So and we if we agree to use the option for then it's okay for the authors and then maybe we can consider to update the 8342 and 7950 in the future when once we feel we are ready to do that or we have more direction to do that that's the last slide of my presentation I took myself, I never left the queue, but then I came back. Um, the second bullet point is interesting. It, it says, uh, should uh, 8342 be updated to clarify? And I think these clarifications aren't specific to the system, uh, you know, config draft, but mm -hmm. in general, like there seems to be some in um, misunderstanding with regards to what NMDA was trying to say. And, it, it, it almost contradicts itself with statements about running must be valid and yet intended as subject to configuration uh, to a validation um, in, a, you know, as a completely separate activity, updating 8342 to make clarifications so that we don't have to come back to this would seems to be uh, that would be helpful. OK. I, but that may be true, but I'm not sure that's going to be any easier than the discussion today. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I guess we can take it off the plate of this draft, uh, but moving it to a different plate, I don't think is going to make it any easier or faster. I think we should state whether updating the 8342, is it a condition for this draft or? Is that a separate task? And I think Quifang probably likes a separate task better. Yes, I tend to agree. I think it's a quite fundamental concept regarding Young and Conf and should not be limited to the system configuration. And thus, maybe could be discussed separately, right? Uh, yes, I also agree that I don't. I think it's best if this one leaves three, four, two, and seven nine fifty alone. Mm -hmm. oh, well, actually, I think it can update three, four, two to talk about how the system data store is uh, is in is connected in. But I don't think it should be updating to change the behavior of running. I think that's that would be best done in Yang next. Yes. I'm sorry, uh, Rob. I don't know if it can be done in our uh, seventy nine fifty biz because uh, 8342 is not dependent on it. Uh, I think 7950 bits because could always update 8342. That would be allowed, I think, under the rules. 
don't think you can, I don't think there's anything that would stop that. I'm sure whatever the process is, that could be done. All I'm saying is, I don't think we should have a third document sort of update, either updating running or restating that running is always valid. I think that would just make life more tricky in the future because we've got to update more places. The fewer places we say it, the better. And then if you have a separate document, then you can have the option of support that or not. So that's not a nice idea. Okay, good point, um, Robin Balazs. We can uh, hold updating 8342 till later. Um, okay, so uh, five minutes. And I think we've come to final conclusions, uh, but I want to just ensure Shafan, do you feel um, as you know authors that questions have been resolved are there any open issues that you you, you want to think some more about or you need more discussion yes i think uh no actually i think all of the uh open issues should be resolved today and really good discussion so the authors are happy to make updates according to the discussion we have today that's what I want to say. <laughs> Excellent. That's the outcome we, we wish to have. Um, so in terms of, unless anyone ha else has comments to make, uh, next steps would be to uh, an update to the draft. And then um, hopefully we could run it through working group last call. Mm -hmm. And I saw in the chat that Rob suggests that the draft should uh, perhaps update uh, 8342 to clarify the system origin. And I that, that that's right, and I agree. So it will be reflected in maybe in the next word. Oh, it's already the case that the draft updates 8342, but maybe the origin handling need to be clear. Okay, <laughs> well, thank you, everyone. Um, I guess we can give back three minutes. Very much appreciate everyone joining and, and lively discussion. It actually carried on longer than I expected, um, or Lou and I thought that we might end earlier, but uh, it, it apparently we had a lot to discuss. So I'm very appreciative to uh, Shafan and you know, preparing these slides. I think they were very helpful. And um, and uh, and this is why we do virtual interims, right? Because the ten minute a slot that we have in the meetings just aren't sufficient to get this to this level of detail. So, thank you, everybody. Bye. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Bye all. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.